023 Reproduction and Family Structure Part 1. The Ottoman Empire was a dynastic state, whose continuing existence was dependent upon the ability of the Sultan to produce male heirs and whose political stability was, to a degree, dependent on stability within the imperial family and household. Questions of dynastic reproduction, family structure and succession were therefore, matters of major political importance. It was the rules Islamic or, more precisely, Hanafi law, that determined the structure of the dynasty. These do not, if carried to their, logical conclusion, create a family around the persons of husband, and wife, but rather a patriarchal household around the person of a, father, in law, therefore, the sultan was sole head of the dynastic family, as much as he was sole ruler of the empire. For this reason, too, the notion of a formally recognized queen, although not of a de facto, powerful woman, was as alien to the Ottoman Empire as it was to other Islamic polities. The essential rules of family law are these. One a woman may marry only one husband at a time, who must also be the social equal of her family. A man, by contrast, may marry up to four wives simultaneously, and his wife or wives need not be his social equals. A Muslim woman may not, therefore, marry a non-Muslim man, as his religion makes him her social inferior. A Muslim man, on the other hand, may marry a non-Muslim woman, a rule which was to be an important factor in dynastic politics. What was most important, however, for the structure of the dynasty was the rule which allows a man to own and have sexual relations with as many female slaves as his pocket allows. A man may produce legitimate offspring by either a wife or a slave. All his children by a wife are automatically freeborn, and have an automatic right to inherit. So, too, is his child by a slave, so long as he recognizes it as his own. When he does so, the child's slave mother acquires a privileged status within the household. Her master may not sell her, and she becomes automatically free on his death. There is no difference in legal status between a man's child by his wife, and a recognized child by a slave, since a person's legal descent is through the father rather than through the mother. These same rules applied to the Ottoman dynasty. Most of the sultans were the offspring of slave mothers, and the sultanate descended in the male line only. Descendants in the female line had no right to the throne, and dynastic custom forbade them to occupy any office, superior to that of provincial governor. The law also permits, or even requires, a man to confine each wife, to the house, and obliges him, in return for this, to provide her with, adequate maintenance. By custom, rather than by law, other female, members of a family tended to suffer similar restrictions, and it was, these legal and customary rules that underpin the institution of, the harem, effectively creating a private female world which contrasted with the public world of men. The Ottoman dynasty reproduced this structure. Within the palace, the harem was almost inaccessible from the men's quarters, except to the sultan himself, and the eunuchs appointed as its guardians. The harem may, at times, have been a site of political power, but it was invisible to the outside world. The public sphere of the palace was exclusively male. Since females could not inherit the throne, the first duty of an Ottoman sultan or prince was to produce male heirs, which he could, by law do either through a wife or through a slave concubine. Before, 1450, the sultans usually married, but it seems from an early period too, have been the custom of the dynasty to reproduce through slaves, the function of wives being political rather than reproductive. Too. In Ottoman tradition, the descent of the dynasty begins with the marriage of the first ruler, Osman, d. circa 1324, with Malhan, the daughter of the dervish Etabali, and mother of the second ruler, Orhan, circa 1324-62. The story is clearly legendary, but the name Malhan may be a truncated version of a certain Malhachan daughter of Omer Beg and Apos, whose name appears as a witness to a trust deed of Osman's son, Orhan. It is possible that this lady was Osman's wife and Orhan's mother. Her father's title Beg, Lord, at this epoch, suggests that he was an independent lord who had perhaps married his daughter too. Osman for political reasons. This, however, is speculation. The mother of the third Ottoman ruler, Murad I, 1362-89, was also, if one is to believe Ottoman tradition, a wife rather than a slave. Her name, as an inscription in Iznik attests, three was Nilifer, water lily, and the tradition makes her daughter of the Greek ruler of Yasser, whom Osman had captured and given as a bride to his son, Orhan. Like most stories of the early Ottomans, However, this tale is quite possibly a fiction. The lady's name suggests that she was a slave. Whatever Nilifer's status, the Ottoman preference for reproducing through slaves seems to have become established with Murad I, the mother of his son and successor, Bayezid I, 1389-1402, was, as, 
two surviving trust deeds show, for a certain Gulchichek, Rose, and, again, her name suggests that she was not a free woman, of Bayezid's, sons, the chronicler Shukrula wrote in about 1460, he had six sons, Erkfrol, Amir Suleiman, Remelia, 1402-11, Sultan Mehmed, I, Anatolia, 1402-13, 1413-21, Prince Isa, Prince Musa, Remelia, 1411-13, and Prince Mustafa, their mothers were all slaves he made the same. Remark of the sons of Mehmed I, he had five sons, Prince Murad, 2, 1421-51, Prince Mustafa, Prince Ahmed, Prince Yusuf, and Prince, Mahmud, the mothers of all of them were slaves. So, too, were, Huma, the mother of Mehmed II, 1451-81, and Gulbahar, the mother, of Bayezid II, 1481-1512, Asia, the mother of Bayezid's son and successor, Salim I, 1512-20, was an exception. She seems to have been, the daughter of Allah Edival, the ruler of Dulgadir, who had married, Bayezid in a political alliance before his accession to the throne, when he was prince governor of Amasya.5. Throughout its history, the Ottoman dynasty continued to reproduce through slaves, but between the 14th and early 16th centuries it was also the custom to restrict each consort's reproductive life to a single son. Once she had borne the sultan a male heir, she, never again entered his bed. It was, it seems, the politics of succession, that determined this practice. From the moment of his birth, every, son of a prince or sultan was eligible for the throne, and so became a, political rival to his brothers. Princes did not, therefore, grow up, together. Instead, each mother raised her son separately and when, at, the age of 10, 11 or 12, the sultan, as was customary, appointed him governor of a province, his mother accompanied him, to his new post and became his moral guardian. In this way, each, mother became a senior figure in the household that formed around, her son in his provincial posting, and his sponsor in the contest for, the throne that would inevitably follow the death of the father.6. This at least was the pattern of reproduction and maternal care, until the reign of Suleiman I, 1520-66. This sultan broke with custom, not apparently for reasons of politics, but for love. In 1521, the, sultan had a single living son, Mustafa, whose mother was a slave, concubine called Mahidevran. In the same year he produced another, son, Mehmed, by Hiram, the concubine whom European sources, remember as Roxolana. At this point, by dynastic custom he should, have had no more sexual contact with her, but instead, between 1522, and 1531, she bore him six more children, including his eventual successor, Salim II, 1566-74. Such was his affection for Hiram that, in, 1533, in a break with tradition which seems to have scandalized contemporaries, he set her free and married her. When she died in 1558, she was buried in the grounds of the Suleymana A Mosque, next to, the Sultan's own mausoleum, as a lasting token of his affection. Hiram's position as mother of more than one son altered the political structure of the dynasty. Unlike previous mothers of princes, she, did not accompany her sons to their governorships in the provinces, but remained in Istanbul at the center of power, with immediate access to the Sultan. In this sense, she prefigured the powerful, women of the late 16th and 17th centuries, Hiram set a precedent, before his accession to the throne, Suleiman's son, Selim II, had produced several daughters and one, son by his favorite concubine, Nurbanyu, by birth of Venetian of, noble, if illegitimate descent, after his accession, he produced six, more sons, each, it seems, by different mothers, but he differed from, his predecessors in that he recognized his son by Nurbanyu, Murad III. 1574 to 95 as his legitimate heir and followed his father in apparently taking Nurbanyu as his legal wife giving her a position of power similar to the one which her mother-in-law Hiram had enjoyed unlike Hiram however Nurbanyu outlived her husband and between 1574 and her death in 1583 she continued to enjoy a political role as mother of the reigning sultan although she was apparently not resident in the palace after Salim II's death her successor, Sifie, eight followed a similar career. She too was a favorite concubine with whom Murad III had apparently enjoyed a monogamous relationship until the death of their second son in 1581. Between this date and his death, Murad produced, apparently at his mother's instigation, 19 sons by different concubines, but it was still Sifie's surviving son, Mehmed III, 1595-1603, to 
who ascended the throne in 1595, with his mother, Sophia, as a dominant figure. The power of the Queen Mother became particularly pronounced during the 17th century, with the long reign of Kosam Mahpaker, the favorite of Ahmed I, 1603-17. She was the mother of four of Ahmed's sons, of whom two, Murad and Ibrahim, were to become Sultan. Her period of power began in 1617, when Ahmed's mentally defective brother, Mustafa I, 1617-18, 1622-3, came to the throne. After Mustafa's deposition in the following year, his successor, Osman II, 1618-22 Ahmed I's son by a different mother, banished her from the palace, but she returned after Osman's murder in the Janissary Rebellion. Osman's successor was the feeble-minded Mustafa, and his accession to the throne brought his own mother temporarily to a position of power. Mustafa, however, lost his throne after less than a year and it was then that Kosam's own son, the 12-year-old Murad IV, 1623-40 became sultan. With his accession, Kosam effectively took over the government on his behalf, and remained his close advisor even after he had reached adulthood. On Murad's death, her last surviving son, Ibrahim, 1640-48, succeeded. When his mental instability threatened the safety of the realm, Kosam seems to have played a role in conducting the government, and continued to do so after Ibrahim's deposition in 1648, until her murder in 1651, at the instigation, it is rumored, of Turin Sultan, mother of the new Sultan, Mehmed IV, 1648-87. For the next five years, Turin was regent on her son's behalf until, with her consent, Kuprulu Mehmed Pasha assumed the post of Grand Vizier in 1656, with virtually sovereign powers. From this date, the political power of the Queen Mothers faded. The Ottoman dynasty, therefore, reproduced almost exclusively through slave concubines.